Well, hey everyone, can you believe it? We are on the second to last day ending the series of Bible in one year. And if you're like, you know, if you're confused about how this reading plan works, let me just tell you, in 2021, we have been going through Genesis to Revelation three different times, and that's our plan. We did this once from January to May, we did it this summer from June to August, and we're about to start again on September 6th through December 31st, going from Genesis to Revelation. And if you're like, how is this Bible in one year? Well, let me just tell you, each time we do this, go through Genesis to Revelation, you'll notice that we'll, you know, we've been covering different books and different chapters of the Bible. However, all three together, right, all the way from January to Revelation, it will accumulate to reading the entire Bible in one year. So hopefully that makes sense. And so as we wrap up today and tomorrow, please join back with us in our church this coming Monday as we jump back into Genesis 1. But today, I want to focus on this little book called Jude, okay? And just for reference, Jude, he's one of Jesus' four brothers. And the interesting thing about this is that none of them, none of the brothers, right, including Jude, followed Jesus as the Messiah. And it was only after Jesus' death and resurrection that they believed and became his disciples, okay? And I was thinking about this, like, I, I totally get it, right? If my brother told me that he was the Messiah, I'd be like, you've got to be kidding me, okay? And so, um, but anyways, the verse I want to focus on today is verse three. It starts off with him saying, dear friends, dear friends. You know, we don't know the specific community he's writing about or who he's writing to, but what we do know is that he's writing to a community mostly made up of Messianic Jews. And on top of that, his writing style, it completely assumes that this group already has a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Bible. And so he says, dear Friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. Okay, so let me just stop there. See, Jude, he wanted to write about a completely different topic. And so why does he not do that? It's because he is recognizing that there is an urgent matter that he's going to have to address. And here's what he says. If you continue reading, he says, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. And so why does he feel this way? In verse 4, he says, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. And if you continue, he says, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign Lord. See, I don't know about you, but when I think about these last two verses, I just think about, man, it relates so much of today. You know, in as much as Jude will focus on the abuse of money and sexual immorality and even the comparison against Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, doesn't it just sound like our world today, right? Especially Western Christianity. I mean, let's just take sexuality. I'm not lying here, okay? Over the past two to three weeks, I have never heard more controversy, more opinions, and more thoughts on same-sex attraction, on gender, on sex before marriage. I mean, so many related things to that. And even though I listened to all of these opinions, one of which was actually a pastor, right? None of them shared one time what God thinks, nor did they go to the source of God's word. All they said is basically what they felt. You know, and here's the scary thing about this, is that so many of these people... They're influential, especially in the Christian world, and they are empathizing with people above empathizing with God. And here's the other thing I noticed, right? Their views from all, you know, the views from all of these people, all of them were so widely diverse. And the reason why is because they are getting truth based upon how they feel. You know, some were even saying things like, well, you want to know what my truth is? I mean, they're not even talking about God's truth at all. And in the same way that Jude is talking about these false teachers who have slipped in among them, I do believe the same is true today. You know, there are more and more people who bear the name Christian, but yet don't preach or live out the full message of Christ. And uh, so as I thought about this, you know, there's really two things that I want to leave us with. Um, and I feel like I could talk on this topic for forever. And so, uh, so let me just try to wrap it up. Okay, number one is this. If we are not rooted in scripture, your truth, it's not going to be truth at all. You know, you are merely placing yourself as judge, determining what's right and wrong apart from the judge. As believers, our worldview is not determined by what we feel or what we see, is it, right? Our worldview is based upon who God is and what God says. Therefore, ensure you don't fall on what you see, but you stand on what he says. And the only way to do that is to read and to reflect on his word daily. And if you don't do this, you'll be made up of truth. You'll have so much truth that is so fluid and it varies from everyone else's truth, but you won't be aligned 
to the truth. And so in summary, stay submitted and stay committed to his word. Okay, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that word contend. Jude says in verse 3, I urge you to contend for the faith. You see, with so many views floating around our culture right now, we can't sit back, you know? I can't tell you how many people will say, well, I just respect their truth. You know, if other believers are speaking things that are not truth, we are not called to respect their truth, but we are called to speak the truth and we're called to contend for the truth, which is our very own faith. And so, um, you know, I looked up the word contend. It means by definition to assert something as a position in an argument. You know, obviously, okay, if they're not willing to receive it, don't try to continue to contend for it. You know, uh, Proverbs 9, 7 says, whoever corrects a mocker invites insults, whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. However, all in all, as a people of God who are becoming more and more in the minority of people who are wholly devoted on what he says and not on what we see, I encourage you to not passively sit by. When you don't communicate anything, it will naturally communicate that you are agreeing with what culture and what the world is communicating. And so therefore, let us stand up and contend in a biblical way for our faith and for God's word and for what he deserves. Thanks, everyone.